Today, I want to speak about um, the fact that we are, all of us, I think probably, feeling in some ways more disorientated than perhaps um, at any other point in our life. If you know that the question, if someone says to you, hey, how are you doing? Normally, normally for me, that kind of question is quite an innocent question, um, which I can answer relatively concisely. But when someone says, hey, Tom, how are you doing now? I, I don't know if you're like me, but I have no idea what's going to come out of my mouth at <laughs> any given moment, any given hour, let alone day. I, I just feel hugely disorientated, hugely disorientated. I don't know what's up, what's down. Um, you know, with every passing day, it feels like the news is changing. One minute we're kind of flattening the curve and then the curve is getting bigger and job losses are real and sometimes it seems like the news is good and then sometimes it feels like things are really bleak um sometimes i love technology and i'm like yay for technology and then the other days i really really don't and uh it's something that just kind of um kills me uh you know one day we'll be walking through the park as a family and i'll be like oh this is great and um this is great <laughs> we're out in the open air this isn't so bad. And then suddenly you spot the other family or the other person coming up and you have, you know, the, the whisper conversation with your kids of, of six feet, six feet, my love. And you're trying to be polite, but at the same time you are uh, feeling excruciatingly <laughs> embarrassed. How do I scream to get six feet without sounding rude? Um, it's just it kind of crazy at the moment and it kind of reminds me actually of a story i read a little while ago that apparently in the midwest of america uh, a while ago they they quite regularly used to find farmers dead very near their farmhouses and they didn't know what on earth was going on and then they eventually figured it out that what was happening was that in the midwest you would apparently get these uh, very very intense blizzards, these snowstorms that would come in so fast and so intense uh, that farmers, even if they were very near their farmhouse, wouldn't know which way they were facing. And they were just, through sheer disorientation, would freeze to death just a few feet away from the sanctuary of their farmhouse. And so what they started doing was placing these ropes, tying ropes from the farmhouse across the farmyard to other secure points across um, that space so that when those storms occurred as they surely would that the the farmers and the farm workers could kind of basically put their hand in the air and then they would suddenly find a rope they would find their rope their hand would get on that rope and as long as they held that rope and were securely on it even if they went the wrong way originally that and they they would follow it back the other way and they would find themselves getting to a place of safety it was all about finding the rope and honestly i feel like i'm in that blizzard right now anyone else here feel like at the moment you're in just metaphorically a real blizzard season um so the, the kind of the, the key question for us my friends is that in, in those kind of seasons, what is the true rope that we need to grab and hold on to for dear life? Because the reality is we are being offered so many possibilities of ropes. The rope of good planning, the rope of staying just you know physically well, um, the rope of staying six feet away, the rope of financial planning, whatever it might be. There's so many ropes being offered to us at such a time as this and they're not bad ropes they're kind of they're reasonable ropes but my question for us today here as we are in for me at least in my lifetime something of an unprecedented storm what is the true rope that the bible speaks about that we have to find and hold on to and if you've got a Bible, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Because in this bit of the Bible, a guy called Paul is speaking to a church in a, in a place called Corinth. And they were going through a storm, a blizzard. It was kind of honestly a blizzard of their, <laughs> of their own making. As let's be honest, they often are. Um, 
these guys were in a blizzard because they were just, I don't know, they were getting into celebrityism, making much of certain Christian leaders. They were honestly just taking um, liberty when it came to the grace of God. And they were just, they were going to excesses in ways that weren't wise. There was a lot of stormy, confusing disorientation happening. And in fact, just in the previous um, chapter, Paul has been saying, God is not a God of disorder. He's a God of order. So Paul is building this case to a church that's in a blizzard. What is the great rope we must grab and hold on to? And I love it. In this penultimate chapter, he's building, building, building the kind of expectation of what is this thing that we must hold on to, Paul, when life is absolutely crazy. And here he, here he says it, verse 1 of chapter 15. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preach to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel, you are saved. Here we go. If you hold firmly. Do you see that? If you hold firmly to the word I preach to you, otherwise you believed in vain. For what I received... I passed on to you as of first importance. So whenever Paul says something is of first importance, we need to be getting a little bit excited on the edge of our seats all across the world. What is this thing of first importance? Here we go. That Christ died for your sins. He's experienced the hellish experience we should all experience one day. It's already happened. He's done it. Hallelujah. According to the scriptures, i.e., the Bible before Jesus came was all leading up like the drum roll of drum rolls. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. Someone's going to take our place. That he was buried. That he was raised on the third day, according again to the scriptures. It's not a new plan. God had been giving us a lot of time, planet Earth, to get our heads around the big plan. And then, here we go, he appeared to Peter and then to the twelve. And then after this, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers at the same time most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. And then he appeared to James and then to all the apostles. And last of all, he appeared to me also, as to one abnormally born. For I am the least of the apostles. I do not deserve even to be called an apostle because I, Paul, persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. Whether then it was I or they, this is what we preach, and this is what you believed. Hallelujah. This is great news if you're watching this and you, you just think Christianity is about trying to be good or, you know, going to church or whatever. I want to just blast that lie to kingdom come. This is of first importance. When you're in a blizzard, Paul says there are, there are two reasons why here this gospel, which the gospel means the good story, the good news about the death. And here we celebrate today the resurrection. Why is this such good news and of first importance? There's two reasons that Paul gives that we'll briefly look at before we sing a song of worship again. And we'll hear about some Lego as well. Um, number one, because the resurrection it brings security to our minds. And number two, it brings deep encouragement to our hearts. Two things that he touches upon here. That's why this rope is unlike any other rope. Number one, he says here, Christ died for our sins, that he was buried, and that he was, say it with me, raised. He was he was raised. So first of all, just to state the really obvious, which, you know, when you're in a storm and a blizzard and up is down and to quote Mary Poppins, up is down and left is right or whatever it might be. You know, when you are honestly like so disorientated, Paul is like, Christians believe a dead man came back from the dead and he is alive here today. It's as simple and as plain and as cosmically significant as that. He says, I want you to remember as of first 
importance that he was buried and he was raised. Now just notice the language that Paul is using here. He's using very sort of plain language, isn't he? He's not trying to be all flowery. He's not trying to be all elaborate and mystical. You know, when you're in a storm and your life is honestly really painful and confusing, whatever that storm or blizzard might be, you just need things really clear. Just really plain. Give it to me, Paul. Like, a, Just give it to me so I can get my head around it. Even our kids can understand what Paul is saying here. It's almost like the language of a witness, like a legal witness. And, and that's, he's saying, look, this happened. It was, it was pre predicted in the scriptures. He was actually physically buried. He was raised on a specific day. And that he appeared to people with specific names, specific hair color, with real eyeballs and real brains. And they actually saw this physically happen. Okay? The, 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 the Christianity, to quote Tom Wright, the great Bishop of Durham, here is first of all a question of history before a question of theology. So you, you might think the Christians are just people who are like, oh, just believe. It's a nice thing to believe, like believing in Santa. No, 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 no. Paul is saying Christians actually believe this historically happened. And even the style of the language in its plainness is meant to somehow not distract us from the historic element of what he is trying to get at. You see that? It's funny that both C.S. Lewis and uh, Tolkien, who were greatly into mythology and the great legends of the North, uh, and they loved it. When they actually talked about the style of scripture, particularly the Gospels, they both commented on this plainness. It's interesting. C.S. Lewis says this. He says, I'm perfectly convinced that whatever else the Gospels are, they are not legends or myths. I have read a, lot, a great deal of legends and myths, and I'm quite clear that they are not the same sort of thing. They are not artistic enough to be legends. I love that. C.S. Lewis was saying, honestly, the Bible's main aim is to get you mentally convinced about this historic event that happened. So that when you are in that place of a blizzard and a storm, you know what to hold on to. And I think this is actually surprisingly important, isn't it? Because probably all of us, particularly in the West, maybe for the first time have felt that real taste that I'm not in control. I'm not actually in control of my life. I had a nightmare a few weeks ago. I'm pleased my kids have left the room. But, and in that nightmare, honestly, I just, I, was, I had a nightmare that San Francisco was right, there was rioting, that the police had lost control and that my kids were dying and they couldn't breathe and I couldn't do anything to help them. Now, okay, thank God that may not ever happen. That may not be a, a likely scenario, but I tell you, um, when I woke up, what I actually found myself deeply and most comforted by was the fact, the historic fact of the raised man, Jesus Christ from the dead. I was like, what can I give my kids? Can I, how do I, how do I actually give something to my children in this life that really is like immovable? I can't control their lives. I can't control ultimately how long they have on this earth. I can't even control ours. But what I was reminded of mentally, I can give them. I can give them this message that there is a man who is alive, I believe, with a real resurrected body who came from death to life. And I know that sounds crazy, but I actually mentally, honestly believe it is true. I think Paul probably was regarded more as a crazy man because he talked nonstop about the resurrection than a moral man. I think Christians are known as, oh, the moral police. And I think Paul was known most as the man who believed that Jesus Christ had come back from the dead and he really physically did because he met him on a road and he saw him. That's a very different first thing to get to rather than uh, you're sinful and you need to feel sinful. Oh, Christianity is first and foremost about the historic event of Jesus Christ coming back from the dead and then the theological implications of that. And this is hugely securing for your minds, okay? for your minds when actually you're in a storm. But there is, there's a mental hurdle to get to, amen? 
there's, it's not actually the easiest thing to just believe. In fact, the reason that Paul was saying this to this church was because they had had people saying to them, this didn't really happen. And you know what? You're not going to you're not going to experience a resurrection when you die. And the rope of the resurrection in the church in Corinth had actually been ripped away from them. And Paul was deeply alarmed. He was saying to them, don't believe that. You see, many in the church in Corinth were like, honestly, like a lot of people in this world who, in an arrogance of intellect, think that a rationalistic approach to life is the only approach. I know I can certainly be someone who falls into that trap where rationalism, i.e. an anti-miraculous, an anti-supernatural mindset, means we don't really believe that we will one day have a resurrection. And that we don't therefore really necessarily believe that Jesus rose from the dead. Because you see, for Paul, he's saying, listen, if you don't believe, O church in Corinth, in your future resurrection, you're effectively saying that Jesus didn't rise from the dead either, because they are so inextricably linked. Because Jesus was the firstborn of many, it says. So this is huge for us. And we can understand the same mistake that the Corinthian church was falling into, which was like, well, we don't really believe in that sort of supernatural dynamic. When they believed in certain elements of the supernatural, clearly, if you look at what the church was like, but they didn't believe in this. And let me ask you this. Let me ask this first question. Is the resurrection something that Jesus has been raised from the dead physically? And that the Bible says that one day you are promised by grace, if you are a Christian, you've placed your faith in Jesus, that you will one day also inherit a resurrection body and you will live on a resurrected earth with a resurrected Christ. Is that something that mentally is your rope when you are in those times? Is that something that you hold on to above all else? In fact, let me just quickly, just really, just take 10 seconds and think, what's the other alternative ropes that give you security other than the resurrection of a man from the dead? And I'm just going to give you five seconds, and then I just want just two or three of you to unmute yourself. And in one word, just be really vulnerable for a moment and tell me, tell us, what are the alternative things that you sometimes hold on to you grasp onto when you're in the storm right now rather than this thing okay just two or three just be vulnerable for a moment what other things do you hold on to rather than this we said go on customers We said intelligence. <laughs> intelligence, fantastic. I can't, I can't rely on that, but my, <laughs> my, own, my own plans, um, and then, then I realized that it's a really sort of tenuous route. Very good, yeah. Own plans, intelligence, what others? Yeah, I was just gonna say cleverness or out planning, trying to work hard enough. Yes. Yeah, my, myself myself absolutely i think this is i think this is so helpful this is so true we tend to not even mentally think about a historic event but you see for paul he's saying listen as you think about the future O corinthians wherever you are right now whether it's cambridge whether it's san francisco or whether it's wherever the reality is is as paul was saying listen this is a rope it's like a golden thread to quote gordon mcdonald a golden thread but the resurrection is like a rope that happened in the past but gives us massive huge confidence for the future if it actually happened and if you're watching this and you maybe wouldn't call yourself a christian my one uh, request above everything is that i would leave you with is this thought have you ever grappled with this thought that a dead that Christians believe a dead man actually came back from the dead and he's alive because I remember talking to a dear friend of mine who said oh Tom I think your Christian faith is great but it's just for you it's like a private thing and for once in my life I was a little old and I said honestly my friend I actually don't think that's logically true because if I logically believe that a dead man came back from the dead and he's alive and that's my greatest security that I hold on to my ultimate insurance policy 
then surely if there's a 1% chance that that's true and you have insurance on your phone and you have healthcare insurance and you have car insurance and house insurance, surely if there's a 1% chance that he really did come back, then actually logically that isn't just a private thing for me, but that's something that, that really is worthy of thinking about, particularly if you've got kids and you want them to be equipped in life to think about what is this life about and how do I make the wisest choices? So it's, it's security for our mind, but it also Paul here, and with this I'll finish, he actually also says the resurrection is a rope for our spirits, for our souls, for our hearts. He says this, he says that he was raised on the third day, verse four, but look with me, verse five, and then he appeared to Peter. And after that, he appeared to more than 500. And though someone fall asleep, he appeared to James. And then last of all, he also appeared to me. Four times he uses the word appeared. You see, what he's also getting at, as well as saying that the real rope in the blizzard of this life is the fact of the historic fact that a dead man came back from the dead. And if that's true, then perhaps you're not crazy to put your faith in this Christianity thing. Maybe, just maybe, you're the wise, it's a wise decision. But then he also, he sort of brings it into the, into the present tense. And he starts speaking, not just in terms of a dead man being raised, but he keeps going on about this whole thing of appearing. Why is he saying that? He appeared, he appeared, he appeared. Well, partly it's because he's obviously trying to back up the evidence that, that all these people, many of whom died for their faith in this raised man from the dead, that they actually saw him. But there's something that's actually uh, even deeper than just the head knowledge is that the Christian God is a God who loves to appear to his people on earth, to this people in this world. He loves to appear to them. You see it from Genesis right the way through to Revelation that Adam and Eve are walking in the garden and God walks with them. He appears. You think about Abraham, how there's just this normal guy, old guy, and God appears to him. And then you think about Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Moses and David and then Saul, the guy who becomes Paul, who's writing this bit of the Bible. You see it again and again, this is huge theme that the Christian God is not some God who sits off lofty in some kind of removed part of the universe near Pluto. You know, he actually loves to appear. He's a friendly God. He's a God who delights in this little earth that he's created. It's it's very special to him is what Christians believe. There's a warmth. There's a warmth to this aspect of the gospel that so often we forget. You see, if we only focus on the cross and the death of Christ, as vital as that is, we actually miss the f a certain element of the flavor of the good story, the resurrection and the appearing of Jesus. That is so important. Uh, again, Tom Wright, he talks about asking a Greek Orthodox priest about the cross. He says, what do you think about the cross? And every time that he asked this Greek Orthodox priest about the cross, apparently he's, he just said, it's a prelude to the resurrection. It's a wonderful, vital prelude to the resurrection. And apparently every time he said it, this beautiful Greek Orthodox priest, he had a beaming smile on his face. And what Tom Wright was getting at was his own realization that in his zeal to focus on the cross and his actual neglect, of the fact that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead and appeared and loves to appear to normal people like you and me, that he had actually missed something of the warmth and the encouragement and the flavor of the whole gospel. Yes, the cross, of course, but ultimately the cross leads to the resurrection of Christ. And in fact, if we don't have the resurrection, the cross, as Paul says, even in this 1 Corinthians 15 passage, then we are more to be pitied. If there's no resurrection, then the cross was irrelevant. But if the resurrection did occur, and if he did appear, and in fact, he still appears now. He still appears now. Literally, how many, particularly Muslims across the world, have said, I became a Christian because this man appeared to me, and I realized he's Jesus. I met a woman, Josie and I did, in a cafe in San Francisco three weeks, three or four weeks ago. She can't have been three weeks ago, we're in lockdown. Maybe two months ago, I don't know. And she, 
she was the most, she said, uh, seven years ago, I was the angriest atheist you could ever meet. And I went to the, my dad forced me to go to this Catholic church one day and Jesus Christ appeared to me. And I just don't, I can't, and she, her eyes were welling up and she was telling her story about how she came to know God in this, in this cafe, this crowded cafe of very sophisticated people in San Francisco. And she was just kept on saying, he just appeared to me. I saw Jesus. He's just real. He's like an actual person. He's not just some philosophical idea. He's real. He's real. And Josie and I were like, just, you know, holding back the tears. And, and for so many of us, maybe it's just me, but when I think about Christianity, I, I get the first bit, you know, uh, yes, I believe in my head. But this second part, he appeared and he loves to appear. It's, it's this language of, of the heart. And, and for these guys, they literally saw him. For our friend in that cafe, she, she literally saw him. But actually... You know, the reality is, Paul's saying here, he didn't just see him once. It's like once he'd seen Jesus with his eyes, he then kept on seeing him with the eyes of his heart. He says here, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. Do you see that there's a present tense switch there? He's been talking about a past tense thing and now he's saying, but I am who I am now. I'm doing my job by the grace of God now. Jesus Christ is alive now. He's, he's appearing to me not always physically through my eyeballs, but he appears and he makes himself known. His grace is available to me in my life. And, and you see this amazing connection actually throughout the New Testament. The language of the church and Jesus is like there. One's the body and one's the head. So actually Paul's like, well, I'm in the body and my head is Jesus. So everything I get is from the head. Everything that flows. Jesus just continually makes my life livable. He appears to me when I, when I look out in the morning and I don't just see a nice sunrise. I see Jesus somehow. And when I smell my children's hair, I don't just smell a nice thing. I, there's something of the fragrance of God and all of his goodness that comes through this. Is that, that, listen, I want to say this. I used to be an atheist to the age of 20 and I'm, I'm 42 now. I still... I still can't believe I believe this, that a dead man came back from the, from the dead and he's alive and he really is real. But it's not a head thing only. It's, it's a heart thing. It's that he, he really does somehow appear to us through a thousand different ways. He really wants to appear, not just once and for all, but ongoingly. You see, the, the reason that so many of the early Christians died for their faith and they just couldn't, they couldn't deny his truth, even though it meant them dying in agony, was because he was an actual real person to them. When the aged Apostle John was on the island of Patmos, like, you know, he was on Alcatraz in hell, dying for his faith. But we, you know, the writings of this man are like, but Jesus, I've seen Jesus. I can't ever go back. He's a real, alive person and he wants to appear through through the church it says this in ephesians that, that the manifest wisdom of god that was that through the church that jesus would be known is that through the church you see it's interesting even in the previous passage paul has been saying that for example one thing that christians believe is the, in the gift of prophecy and in a local church it says when someone prophesies people will say for god is in this place god jesus appears it's like he he makes himself known we may not see him with our eyes when peter says although you have not seen him with your eyes yet you love him so the heart of god to appear maybe not we may never literally see him with our eyeballs like paul and others did but the bible says that his heart is that every person every person would understand that christianity is about knowing knowing in our hearts the appearing of god jesus christ emmanuel god with us don't we need to know that man you might be watching this feeling more alone than you've ever felt in your life and and ultimately there is an appearing there is a appearing in your heart a knowledge like where you know god says let there be light and light came he wants to bring light again and again into the hearts of this world. 
and it is a real thing i want to say that for those of you intellectual types who are thinking hmm, this is all a little bit emotional it's all a little bit over the top tom i, I want to say this this is an actual real thing i'm talking about i was um this time exactly last year monday thursday 2019 um my oldest daughter went to a very stripped down service she she was 11 at the time i think and she um she was at this um she was at this monday service and two people came up to her independently and both prophesied over her and she was so aware for the very first time in her life of the presence of the Lord, that he was appearing to her spirit. It was actually not entirely comfortable. It was wonderful. And yet like a holy reverence came over my young daughter. And she came home and she said to Josie, I must get baptized this Easter. She wasn't asking us. <laughs> There was an authority in her spirit that had come that was of God. This was nothing to do with Josie and I. This was God, God, the holy God. And I remember talking to her on the bed a couple of days later, and I said, Daisy, and she's a very like bubbly girl, I said, tell me about this. And there was a seriousness that came over her. And it was like when you realize there's someone in the room and you didn't ever realize that they were there the whole time. There was a holiness, there's a reverence that we're talking about here. This isn't like a light, jokey thing. For a human being to really know that God is real. Man, that is a big deal. And my prayer is if you're watching this, and maybe you're like I was up until the age of 20, and you just ridiculed Christianity, and honestly, sometimes Christians bring it on themselves. But at the centre of it, it's about the historic truth of a dead man coming back from the dead. And that he is now, Christians believe, alive and well, and really in the business of consistently, persistently appearing to those on this earth that he has created. That's the rope that Paul is saying to them, hold on to, hold on to. Hold on to that rope of the resurrection of a God who raised Jesus from the dead and appears. Don't stop holding that rope. Hold on to it with all your heart. But what I love, and with this I will finish, is just notice that he says, by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace to me was not without effect. I worked harder than all of them. I held on to that rope super hard. Yet not I. Yet not I. But the grace of God that was with me. I love that little twist Paul's saying, hold on, hold on, but finally he said, but you know what? The really great truth of the Bible is that of course we hold on. We hold on to this truth. We hold on to the, the hope of the world to come and his great gospel. But the greatest truth is that he holds on to us. He holds on to us. Thank God it's not down to my ability to hold a rope because I am weak, even compared with most men. <laughs> thank god it's not down to my abilities to hold on to him but it's down to his commitment to holding on to us this is the great truth so even if you're here and you say i i'm definitely not a christian i'm just looking in i would say i wonder why you're looking in I wonder why you're here today i wonder whether there's just a slight chance that maybe the god of the resurrection is actually sneaking up on you you think you're looking in like I did when I was 20 and it suddenly dawned on me, oh my word, there's someone else involved in this whole thing. This isn't, this isn't just me pursuing holding on to God. This is, there's something drawing me in. There's an undertow that I'm just only now discovering. My encouragement would be to you, if that's you today, don't, don't waste another day. As best you know, just say, God, if you're there, if you're real. Uh, there's a one percent chance that this resurrection whole thing is real i i don't want to go another day without ignoring it you know fomo let that fo don't miss out let the fomo do its work in you because <laughs> this is a, this is a good fomo to have i would say this is a good fomo man